Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our November JSE Stock Picks. I am your host, Sam Mukorosi. I am the head of origination and deals at, at the JSE. And it really is my pleasure to uh, welcome you today uh, to our stock picks. We have uh, four stock pickers, uh, gentlemen in the industry who will uh, let you know what their uh, stock picks are at this uh, time in the market. Um, first up, we have uh, Tamsan Raneta, who is the CEO of uh, Shiloh Capital, followed by uh, Anthony Clark, who's an independent uh, analyst at uh, Stock Small Talk Daily. And then uh, we have uh, Keith McLachlan, who's uh, investment officer at Integral Asset Management, and uh, Lonabo Makrubela, who is the head of research and portfolio manager at uh, Perpetua Investment Managers. So really looking forward to our time here uh, today. Um, just before we begin, just a reminder that obviously uh, the views expressed today are of the uh, guests um, and uh, do not necessarily reflect the views of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Um, with that disclaimer out the way, um, let me welcome uh, Tam Sangha. Um, Tami, welcome. Uh, good, good to have you here. Um, as mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Tami is the uh, CEO of uh, Shiloh Capital. Uh, Tami, do you want to tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, something interesting from a personal perspective that the viewers at home didn't know about you? Um, yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I think the one thing that a lot of people don't know about me is that my younger brothers are twins. Uh, so I was always I was always overpowered in the household. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I think other than that, I think uh, I'm an, I'm quite an open book. Um, so yeah, that's the personal side about me. And and, uh, and and love your uh, traditional outfit. Um, we were talking oh, offline that that uh, Tummy has a uh, a hookup for anybody looking for some traditional wear uh, for the next um, uh, Heritage Day. Uh, Tummy is your man. But uh, today you're not talking about clothes. You are talking about shares. Uh, where where should um, people be looking from a stock pick perspective? Ah uh, well, we we are a strong view of uh, small caps. Uh, we believe there's a massive potential for growth in that area. Um, we also believe that uh, primary services, uh, so agriculture, healthcare, um, education, and those sort of primary manufacturing, anything that's primary has a scope for growth. Uh, especially given how a lot of the commodities are clogged up in Russia, there's a lot of supply chain constraints, and that there's a lot of uh, issues around getting products to market. So locally produced manufacturers and project producers will will win over the medium term. Good. Um, local is lacquer. Uh, and, and, and you still hold your view, even though there seems to be some sign of um, uh, kind of, you know, at least collaboration between uh, Kiev and Moscow. I know that they've just allowed uh, new shipments of wheat uh, to come uh, through the Black Sea. Um, you, you think that local manufacturing is still, in the medium term, a good uh, a good uh, story? Yes. Uh, uh, supply chain is not as easy as downloading an app. Uh, to move right. something across oceans and land is going to take time. Getting it back in motion, getting it... Uh, back in stores, logistics around that, all these things take time um, and it's going to take a while for those supply shocks to be corrected. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the medium term, um, that market share that's being uh, controlled or held by those companies that need offshore uh, products can be taken up by people who can produce them locally. Great. So, uh, Tami, do you want to go into your specific stock picks? Which three shares um, have you selected for us today? Uh, so today we're looking at Stadio, uh, Purple Group, and Orion Minerals. That's our focus for today. And I think we're just going to keep it uh, short and sweet because, uh, as we all know, it's difficult to do sound and deep technical and analysis of a stock in three minutes. So we're going we're gonna to kick off with Orion Mining. Um, they are a development and exploration company. They focus on zinc and copper. Um, and their target market is uh, the steel 
and uh, and copper and hardware and uh, call it uh, the construction or electronics industries, um, both of both of which seem to have some pickup. There's a lot of announcements, especially in the US, around infrastructure upgrades and so on and so forth. Uh, also, given that copper is the third most consumed uh, metal in the world, um, the market is rather big. Uh, the downside is that the way they make money is that they convert a maybe, which is an opportunity set uh, of being able to discover the right quantum of the minerals to be able to mine profitably um, into a yes. Um, those risks exist, but as you continue to look at the data and how they're mining and how they or their they are, they are sampling and how they are testing um, and, and how they're drilling, you get an indication of the size of the resource um, and what's potentially possible given the location of the mine. I think what's also key to an analyze is who's running the business, um, that the, the people in charge can actually convert the opportunity into income. And we believe that the management team led by Errol Smart, who has 20 years of experience in this game, um, is able to do that. Um, what's the key upside? Uh, the key upside is that this is a great mineral. Um, it's used across the world, and it's it's able to supply a various number of industries. Um, copper is also used as as, in, as a rude indicator for um, recessions or or booms. Uh, the demand and supply of it speak to construction and electronics boom. Um, the uh, the other sec second element that's upside is what's happening with Russia and their inability to export product. Uh, that gives an opportunity set, albeit a small window, um, to provide the product. So we we think this is a, a stock that one can hold and uh, will do well over the uh, medium to long term. Uh, the next one is Purple Group. Uh, this is, uh, I must admit, is one of uh, my favorites, uh, given what I believe is the market for what they, they do. Um, they basically uh, provide DIY investing. Uh, which is a key difference from what Robin Hood and the likes or their peers or their so-called peers do where they provide a, a platform for trading. Um, they're looking for people who will come in and actually build and build portfolios and create wealth. So over the long term, their strategy is to create private clients out of their retail clients. Um, if you look at their target market, consider there's 6 million taxpayers in South Africa. Uh, 1 million of them earn above 500,000 rand a year. Um, there's a huge potential for um, domestic, and they've also done some great partnerships internationally as well. Um, so they make money through the asset management side of the business and managing those trades. Um, the, the leadership is great. I think Charles Savage is a great leader. I think he's going to face some headwinds now with the pricing uh, of the stock, their future performance, and they have to work through that. However, they offer great products, not just um, equities, they also offer property, and they also offer access to offshore um, assets as well. Um, and they, they are, their product is quite scalable. It's largely technology, um, which is a great thing. So they are, in essence, a fintech business. Um, and I think that's their upside, that they've got a global market, they can partner globally, and they can cross-pollinate with other sort of platforms across the world to share customers. And I think that's a great way to grow. Um, then finally, uh, my top, my, my number one and favorite stock, Stadio. Uh, Stadio is a company that provides higher education. Um, they've currently got about 30,000 students. And if you look at the target market, you look at people who've got uh, bachelor degree passes from a trick. And if you look at the 2021 numbers, 276,000 uh, students graduated with bachelor degree passes uh, in 2021. And so that's a very large market that's largely under addressed by the current standing universities. Um, so there's always not enough, there's more students and spaces available. Um, they, they make money from the fees and facility operations, and they really run a great ship. I think uh, Chris Foster is a, is a well-known uh, higher education professional. Um, he's the CEO of a business. He's put together a great team of people who, who understand what needs to be done. And I think the greatest market opportunity for them is uh, the online learning and the distance learning that provides students a huge uh, opportunity to get into tertiary education. So we believe that that's a great company. It's going to continue to do well. The market's going to continue to grow for them. And the partnerships that they've structured between themselves uh, and, and the acquisitions they've done 
having had a big brother like Kuroyo and a big brother like PSG, uh, they've, they've been able to build a sizable balance sheet. They also raised some good capital through their BE scheme. Um, so are able to really address uh, a, a broad-based uh, nature of, of, the, of the tertiary education sector. So uh, um, I think they're going to do well, and it's, a, it's, it's one of my very, very favorite stocks uh, at this stage. Um, but yeah, so that's our, that's our three, that's my three um, uh, stocks for today. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Sangla. That's, uh, that's a good broad pick um, and, and really um, just enjoying kind of your, your, your uh, pro-South Africa view and especially around uh, uh, manufacturing as well as uh, kind of just the uh, um, demographics that we face as a country around um, investing in, 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 um, within public education. Uh, through Stadio. Good, Anthony. Um, welcome, welcome back. I should say uh, it's it's always excellent to uh, to have you, um, Anthony. Something that you want to let us know about yourself that, that maybe the view you haven't heard yet. Yeah, hi Sam. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, as my desk behind me sees, uh, it's full of paperwork. Uh, what do people not know about me? Well, they know that I have a very famous Jack Russell dog who's underneath my desk right now sleeping. I also, for my uh, sin, uh, love and own old Land Rovers, which means I have an extremely high diesel bill. And probably uh, rarely for this market, I'm the, probably the only analyst on the JSE that has covered one sector pretty much unbroken for 28 years which is a small to mid cap sector, which is a sector that uh, I absolutely adore. And I spend my life running around visiting companies and trying to, trying to find uh, the next uh, hidden gems. Good, good. Um, yeah, and, and, and your coverage of small stocks is has been uh, longstanding and really appreciated. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, IT is telling me that that uh, my, my, my connection is not so great at the moment, so we'll, we'll try and improve that. Apologies for that. Um, Anthony, why don't you jump straight into it and tell us about your, uh, your three stock picks? Yeah, sure. Um, these are stocks I've covered for quite a long time. Uh, I'll be spending most of my time on Grinrod and Kuro, and then lastly touching on Renogen. Uh, because I know that one of the other panelists will have a far more detailed insight on Renogen. Um, I'll start with Grinrod. Uh, Grinrod is a ports, rail and uh, logistics company, which has been around for, for decades. Um, the company's always had a significant discounted net asset value, and I've had a buy in the stock since November 2020 at 3 rand uh, 70, another one in November 2021 at 534. And as I stand here or sit here today, it's trading at 11 rand. But much of that value has only been unlocked in the last 12 months. Year to date, the stock is up 123%. Now, your listeners may be wondering, why would uh, an analyst like myself recommend a stock which is already up 123% year to date? The answer is there's still more to come. What's occurred in Grunrod in the last 12 months is that management have cleaned up the structure. Non-core assets have been sold. Uh, the recent being the sale for 1.5 billion rand of Grunrod Bank. Uh, debt has been pretty much extinguished, and we now have a much cleaner operating structure involved in what it used to be many years ago, in ports, rail, and general logistics. Uh, we have a management changeover happening at the end of this year, where Andrew Waller, the current CEO, is stepping down, and uh, the current uh, CEO of the rail business, uh, Kulani, is taking over. And we are focusing on what Grinrod does best, which is basically moving things around uh, efficiently and profitably for itself. The other interesting uh, dynamic in the uh, transport sector in this country is the government has suddenly realized that the inefficiencies amongst its state-owned enterprises of Transnet, Portsnet, etc., etc., means there's significant lost opportunity for business in this country. And we all know about the mining companies, as an example, who can't get goods from a mine to the ports because of the inefficiencies of Transnet and the tens of billions of rands of revenue and taxation being lost because of the, uh, of the poor performance of uh, government-owned enterprises. So public-private partnerships will come into play, which will see companies like Grinrod bid for certain rail and port assets alongside other companies to hopefully assist the private sector in getting goods from point A to point B to make this company work and to make this country run more efficiently, hopefully generating more revenue and more taxation. 
Now, Grinrod at 11 Rand um, has a net asset value of just a shy of 12 Rand 50. We've got results coming up at the end of December and more importantly, a very interesting site visit coming up at the end of November uh, to their ports operations in Richards Bay and in Durban. And a significant number of institutions are going on that roadshow. So I think what we're going to see in the next 12 to 18 months is an evolution of Grinrod to far more public-private partnerships, uh, actually expending the capital that they have to actually grow into these new areas of, of opportunities, working with the government and with private industry, and to use the expertise that they have got uh, in running ports in Durban and in Mozambique and in running rail throughout Africa and this country to actually assist a private enterprise to actually move the goods. So to me, despite the fact the stock is up significantly year to date at 11 Rand, I have a target value in the short term of Grinrod on 13 Rand, and it wouldn't surprise me if it goes a lot higher. Now, interestingly, uh, Rembrandt recently sold its stake, and there is whispers in the market that uh, Grinrod could be a, a potential target for anyone looking to consolidate uh, you know, port and infrastructure assets in this country. So apart from having a very good operating uh, performance ahead of it, it potentially has M&A uh, attractions as well. So Grindrod to meet 11 Rand remains uh, one of my top buys. Moving on to Kuro, a private education play which listed in 2011, uh, had a huge run uh, from its initial 7 Rand 50 share price. It ran to nearly 50 Rand. And then for a number of earnings misses, uh, sh the share price slumped all the way back to uh, COVID levels of 4 Rand 62. As we stand today, it's trading at 8 Rand 69, year to date down 31%. Now, that may not sound like an attractive proposition for an investor, but a lot of that is, is predominantly due to the fact that PSG unbundled its 64% stake in Kura Holdings, and that was implemented mid-September. So there's been you know, a huge liquidity event in the stock, keeping the price depressed. Now, interim results were up 41%, um, and, and final results, I'm forecasting 53 cents, which is a year-on-year -year return of around 30%. Now, the PE has started to unwind. It's a little bit expensive compared to Avatech, but having done uh, two site visits to the company in the last few weeks, it is my belief alongside certain other institutional analysts that the company's vaunted J-curve uh, should start to kick in in the next couple of years as debt starts to uh, cap out at 3 billion rand. Cap CapEx also starts to peak in 2024, 2025, significant cash generation, a debt reduction, and the ability to then pay dividends. The key to Kuro is it expanded too quickly, it put down too many schools, and it didn't fill them fast enough. That is now over. They're now utilizing their operations quite effectively, putting more children in the schools, and that's improving the underlying margin. So at 8 Rand 69, once the liquidity event has uh, worked its way through the system, I'm forecasting the next two or three years of very good earnings growth and a very aggressive target price of 16 Rand for Kuro. Let's see if we get there. Lastly, I'm going to touch on Rendezvous. It's trading at 29.809 as I speak, uh, down year to date 14.5%. But from its peak, it's down 42%. Now, it started the year at 33 Rand, had a great run on the anticipation that the uh, liquid natural gas and helium operations would come on stream mid-year. But sadly, uh, due to a combination of, uh, of engineering uh, uh, glitches and snafus, uh, they missed their deadline target. And that then led to a significant outpouring of malice and uh, let's call it Twitterati rantings regarding the ability of Renogen to deliver on promises and its, uh, and its uh, projects. The share price has derated alongside the resources market and the general uh, uh, lessening of risk appetites towards companies like Renogen. Virginia phase one is now basically up and running. They're producing LNG. Ital Tile has received its uh, first consignment and console will too. There has been a slight delay in the helium production. Uh, helium did start uh, to be produced in early October, but the plant had to be shut down. And in, in a recent SENS uh, statement, they indicated that that helium production should, should start soon. So I'm hoping that uh, as production starts coming online, as the company starts producing revenue and some profit, the Twitterati will keep quiet. I'm focusing on what is a 20-year project, not a 20-minute project. So I maintain my buy on Renogen, even at these levels. Great, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, really interesting and encouraging for me to see both kind of Cura and Stadio, of course, um, you know, having kind of come out of the same stable. Um, but that that uh, interesting view on 
um, education is, is is still vital for us uh, as a country in terms of um, our growth and and where the future lies. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, Anthony. Uh, interesting also to see um, you know you kind of going into Jurenogen and um, and uh, Tami going into Orion Minerals. So that that kind of uh, development uh, early stage. And, and growing kind of um, mining space. Um, good to see activity still in, in that space. Um, let us please move on to Keith. Uh, good to have you, Keith, and, and, and uh, uh, welcome back to you as well. Um, Keith, what, uh, what would you like to tell the, uh, the audience about yourself uh, this afternoon? Hi, oh, Sam. Good to be here. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I write fiction in, uh, as, as a hobby in the background. I actually publish it on flashfictionlibrary.com. You can go and read all my poor attempts at being uh, artistic and creative. But uh, probably the one thing that the the world doesn't doesn't really know about me, and you can't find in the Google search, is that uh, I've been a classically trained uh, musician since I was 13 years old, and I've oh, wow. been playing, playing guitar since then. Um, and I still do to this day. Um, but yeah, so that's that's one thing about me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a casual uh, guitarist myself, so maybe we should have a jam session sometime. Um, but but your fiction, what what genre do you do you write about? So I like to mix it up. Um, I like. I like the challenge of exploring different genres. So it's all the way from science fiction to horror to fantasy. I must say, I, I tend to have a preference for science fiction and horror, though. <laughs> Good. Well, hopefully there's not uh, too much science fiction or horror in your stock picks. Uh, do you want to jump straight into into your your three stocks? And and spoiler alert, I think they, 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 there might be an overlap between uh, what uh, Keith and... Uh, um and anthony have chosen go for it keith absolutely thanks sam and you're correct uh anthony ended with renogen so i'll start with renogen he set the scene very well for uh, the challenges that they faced in getting phase one uh, to the point where it is um i see really three value unlocks that are, that are likely to happen within the next you know let's call it three to six months so first of all phase one is currently producing uh, uh lng it should go into production for helium shortly. That'll be the first de-risking fact. Uh, second one is we should be able to pin down phase two, both in terms of the, the finer details in terms of the engineering, but also uh, in, back, in the background, the financing, the mix, the placement, and the equity portion that should, should unlock that. And then really the, 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 the final one and I will get to the implications of this, but the South African Central Energy Fund has um, has invested directly into the subsidiary and the implications for that. But just to stand back and to perhaps give the overview of what Renogen is, Renogen's key subsidiary is Tetra 4. And Tetra 4 holds the gas rights to the Virginia gas project. Those gas rights really are tied into two key outputs. And the first one is methane, that they will clean and compress and becomes liquid natural gas. And in that instance, it's exposed to the tailwinds of the energy market, both globally and domestically. And in both instances, the world is energy starved, and these are important things. And the second output on world quality yields is helium. And that's a global commodity Scarce, uh, scarce in supply at these points, and absolutely critical into uh, the aerospace industry, into me uh, healthcare, me um, medical MRIs, into uh, semiconductors. It's really, really a key, key input, unsubstitutable in in this space. So that's the underlying resource that they are developing. Phase one, like I said, there will be a de-risking moment uh, as as they produce and becomes cash generative. Uh, and importantly, phase two is quantum to the size of phase one. Now, I circle back around to the Central Energy Fund's investment. Uh, importantly, they, they have committed and it has been approved 1 billion rand investment into Tetra 4 at the subsidiary level for 10%. That implies that the remaining 90% is worth 9 billion rand, which equates to effectively 66 rand per Renogen share. As Anthony touched on, Renjin is trading at 28 rand a share. So not just do I like 
uh, the underlying resource, I quite like the valuation as well. Um, next stock is also with tailwinds behind it is Omnia. So Omnia is an integrated uh, chemicals group, importantly embedded and utilizing the ammonia supply chain to generate two key outputs. Simplistically, they make explosives that are used in the production of commodities and mines, and they generate, they make fertilizers, which we obviously use in agriculture. Uh, the world key needs minerals, especially in terms of the green energy transition. We are not producing even fractions of the minerals that we need in order to uh, move the world forward. Um, so that that need is not going anywhere. And in fact, minerals are getting deeper and deeper, further underground. You're going to use more and more explosives to uh, to get them out. It's just nature of the beast there. So, and then in terms of agriculture, well, the world just passed eight billion people. Those eight billion people need to be fed. This is a very, very critical uh, industry. Uh, we need to boost agricultural yields. And uh, especially with the war in Ukraine and the bottlenecks in terms of supply, the long-term tailwinds for fertilizer look very strong, along with the short-term tailwinds. Um, they're sitting on ungeared balance sheet. Their forward, forward multiple is low single digits. Uh, this is this is a very comfortable uh, company. There's probably a final special dividend coming with the with the current set of results as well. And then finally, to touch on the uh, third stock that I like, Santova Logistics. So Santova Logistics is a non-asset place global supply chain manager. So first, let's unpack each of those points. First, non-asset based, they're actually effectively a niche. BPO software company. They don't own the, the trucks, the ships, the warehouses. What they do is they plug into the supply chain and they bulk buy from clients into, into uh, the asset-based uh, logistics companies. And they really bank the spread between that while pushing down uh, the bar rates um, and managing managing the whole flow of goods into uh, internal and external uh, for, for the customers. And they can unpack that from global supply chain so they can even earn on, on both sides uh, of the supply chain. So that's, that's what's really, really great. And if, if the last two, three years of messed up global supply chains has showed us anything, is how utterly critical global supply chains are. Even, even a bifurcating world that's, that's, that's got geopolitical risk sparking, global trade is absolutely necessary. And in fact, the more complicated it is, the more businesses don't want to do it themselves, and they prefer to outsource it to specialists like Santova. And you can see this. As they're opening up more supply chains, signing more clients, and winning market share, they're gaining further and further critical mass. In their latest set of results, um, their revenue was up double digits, their headline earnings up over 60%. Um, they're earning the vast majority of the earnings globally, so they're not even a South African business. And you're getting all of this on a price earnings of only 4.6. Um, this is it's priced as a South African small cap. This is really a global stock, um, playing playing to a lot of uh, tailwinds with really good management. Last thing I'll touch on there is uh, they recently did a small clever acquisition, well priced acquisition into the U.S. They, the view is as they bid that that market is so large and has such high barriers to entry that five to 10 years from now, that may be their largest region. Um, so really, if we were to get one or 2% of global trade, this would probably be the largest stock in the JSE. Um, but that's uh, to summarize, Omnia, Renogen, and Santova, all of them good quality companies, all of them undemanding valuations with great tailwinds behind them. Th thank you, Keith. And I think, you know, the, the kind of large um, international trends are obviously featuring here, um, demographics, growing population, um, you know, kind of uh, trade um, as, 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 as the population grows. And of course, the, the green energy revolution, um, all, all obviously uh, um, uh, coming out through the, the theory. I do have some questions and um, reminder to our viewers, please do uh, send in uh, those questions. 
Um, and and uh, both Keith and Anthony, um, do you want to touch on uh, Renegen's uh, suspension, uh, trading suspension? Uh, uh, Chris Marketbull uh, is the username that's that's put in uh, that that question. I don't know who wants to uh, uh, take that one, uh, Keith or or uh, Anthony. Go for it, Keith. Sure. Um, so building up to phase two. Uh, depending on how you slice and dice the price tag, it's more or less going to cost Renogen a billion dollars to build phase two. Um, they've got debt funding to the tune from effectively a uh, satellite of the US government to 500 billion. They've got interest uh, on, on a remaining chunk of debt. And then don't forget, you've got the billion rand uh, coming in from the central energy fund into into the subsidiary but there's still a remaining portion of equity that needs to be raised so the suspension on and, and they're constantly exploring how to do this it's not urgent that they do it now you can start the project in terms of debt and raise the equity on the back end of it um but in exploring the uh, how to raise it there was a potential opportunity to raise it in australia and unfortunately the australian market is quite leaky uh so what happened was some of this news and one would argue that a capital raise is price sensitive leaked out to the australian market the the correct move by the australian market was to suspend uh, the share until the news can settle and an announcement can be made uh, and they decide to step back from that process and hence the share got unsuspended um, anthony i'm not sure if you'd like to add anything to that you know you know that is basically from what i understand is is true as well but let's not forget that the underlying potential capital raise in australia in the greater concept was actually quite small uh, I think from uh, from my understanding, it was less than 20 million Australian dollars, which in real rand terms is probably just over 220 million rand. So it wasn't exactly a huge sum of money. And that uh, was basically uh, through the interest of some institutions in Sydney and Melbourne who actually expressed interest in taking a stake in Renogen ahead of the potential of Virginia Phase 1 and Virginia Phase 2 and, of course, the potential um, US listing. So the, the placement was basically pari passu to people approaching Renogen saying, we like the story, we want some stock, can you make a plan? And then, as we all know, uh, the leaky Australian market uh, came into play and the right thing to do was the stock was suspended. And then, you know, the, the, the potential placement was canned because, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a Wild West scenario, you do not want to be placing stock in uh, what I would call a, a you know, a, a, a leaky market. So... It's a, to me, it's a storm in a teacup. But the, the real, the real issue was there was interest from Australia. Institutions asked for stock. Um, it was probably going to happen, but the story leaked and it went away. End of end. End of story. Good. Good. Well, uh, uh, let's let let's hope there's greater things uh, to come, and and all the best with their uh, their various fundraise options. Um, uh, Keith, we've got a question for you uh, from Patrick Harper, who says, um, Keith, we know you are coming in hard uh, with Northern, question mark. I, I, I don't know if that's a that's some sort of a, uh, a side private joke, but do you, do you have some views on, on Northern that you might want to share with us? Sure, Sam. Um, I think that question might come from last year on the show, Northern was one of my picks. Yes. Um, and it did perform uh, very well at the beginning of the year, obviously sparked from the Russian invasion into Ukraine. So so the, the original thesis, and it's still the thesis for Northern, is that no one is making any new PGM mines. Uh, so you've got very finite supply, and Northern is ahead of the curve in terms of investing in, in production. So they're one of the few growing PGM production profiles. But mm -hmm. at the same time, You've got uh, in increasing demand for PGM loadings and the catalytic converters. The, you know, the uh, and then throw in the Russian invasion into Ukraine, which kind of shut down the borders for for the export. Or potentially, I mean, it's hard to tell whether Russia is still exporting uh, PGMs or not. Uh, our sense is they are, whilst the price would be a lot higher. But um, 
and, and the combination of those two things makes, first of all, PGMs attractive long term because uh, they demand supplies in the favor of the producers and nor them more attractive because they've got a growing production and into a strong spot market. What what kind of um, made that a lot murkier was their bid, uh, their left field bid for Royal Buffett King Platinum. And it's been interesting watching that play back and forth, effectively a multi-billion rand uh, chess game in on, on the JSC. So Implants needs Royal Buffer King Platinum uh, because they are contiguous to them and their mining in the bottom is actually effectively they they mining into, into RB Plat seam. Um, they obviously pay royalties and the like, um, but they need the continu continuity of RB plants and it was a natural uh, consolidation move for them. What they did not see coming was Northern swooping in and taking a, a, a significant minority stake, which kind of rattled their cage and they had to ramp up and they did a bid for them. Northern then went over the top and they've just recently issued a new bid for them. But uh, so first of all, the the arguments against uh, against Northam's bid for Royal Buffer King Obby Platts is that uh, it's it's really quite large in in a Northam's life. Can their balance sheet sustain it? Uh, how do they fund it? And what if what if you're buying at the peak of the cycle? We bullish PGMs long term, but these are commodity markets and they move very swiftly quickly and it could well yeah. you know, collapse. So how do how do the economics work in in, in a huge downturn um, coupled with financial uh, and balance sheet constraints? But then the the argument in favor of the bid is yes, there's not direct synergies because the resource is not right next door to nor them. Mm -hmm. It is right next door to implants. But no one's building new big PGM mines. This is the last shadow long life PGM deposit of high quality that has been developed and you can mine and you've got a long-term growth profile in here. Just the replacement cost of rebuilding these mines because of the endless um, endless environmental provisions, the, all the community challenges one would face, the ability to need to raise capital and raise capital in a country where energy supply cannot be guaranteed by the main utility it's going to be challenged, challenging to rebuild a mine. The replacement costs of these mines are so big that the market is not pricing them correctly. So, yes, are we still bullish on Northern? Yes. Um, do I like it? Yes. Has it been become a little bit of a murkier pick because of how the world's played out with the global recessions? Uh, well, what is likely to be the global recession? Yes. Um, has it become a murkier pick because of RB Platz's bid, the surprise bid? Yes. Longer term, we still like it. We still hold it. I mean, um, I wouldn't call it one of my top stock picks, but it's important we don't we don't make stock picks. We manage portfolios. And in yes. terms of this this space, it's we it's our, our preferred uh, PGM play in this space. So that's a very long explanation. For what is a very short question, but it's but it's quite quite a complex scenario playing out there. I think I think the drama around uh, Royal Buffer King is is really interesting, and 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 watching that that uh, unfold is, um, is is quite fascinating. This is a multi-billion rand chess game that's playing out. Indeed, indeed. We do have the, some more questions coming through. Uh, Anderson, thank you for. Uh, uh, complimenting uh, the show. Uh, we, we're certainly having fun uh, this side, so glad um, that the audience is, is also uh, finding this valuable. Um, there are some more questions. Um, one for you, um, Tami, around Orion, um, and and uh, one for you, Anthony, on Grinrod. But let me uh, call in Lonobo to um, to let us know his three stock picks, um, and then uh, we'll we'll try and get to those questions at the end. Uh, Lonobo, welcome. Um, I think you're a newbie on the show, so so welcome to you. I'm also a newbie. I think this is this is, this is definitely my first time hosting this. Um, hopefully, I do a good enough job to get invited back. Uh, Lonobo, do you want to tell us something um, about yourself that maybe the market doesn't know? I, uh, yeah, good afternoon, Sam. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think probably what's what I what I found interesting actually is COVID has been excellent for my reading. 
So uh, yeah, so the last three years I've come across some very interesting titles. I'd probably say actually the the ones that have struck me the most, you know, which is a strange confluence of events, is uh, one about thirty three strategies of war. Um, you know, and and then lastly maybe this uh, a book written by a guy called Bill Browder on um, he used to be a Russian fund manager. You know, so a very strange confluence of events, kind of the, that come twenty twenty two that. You know, I found particularly interesting. More recently, I've been reading a title, um, actually about a, the last Tulsa War, um, in which my great grandfather fought in. Um, oh wow! Yeah, yeah, so that's been also quite fascinating, actually, to to learn about. So while the rest of us have become uh, addicts on Netflix, you've uh, you've picked up your reading. Well, well done. Um, and and so hopefully that reading uh, is also inspiring you for some uh, for some stock picks. Uh, why don't you take us through your your three shares? Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, my my first one is actually Anheuser Busch. Um, so a well known beer company doesn't need any introduction. I think what's interesting about them is that since they bought SAB, the shares halved. Whilst the market is up 43%, you know, so massive relative underperformance. And probably the main reason was around the debt. Um, so they ended up with $122 billion worth of debt, um, you know, which is five times cash flows. Um, most businesses get into trouble at around three times, you know, so they've, um, so that was quite a big news around for them. Secondly, beer wasn't growing in the US. Um, so that was a big market for them, 30% of profits um, stagnating. Um, you know, and and then maybe another contributor would be Brazil. So um, Brazil was their most profitable ma- market, um, and profit margins there basically went from 50 to 30 over the last couple of years. Um, so part of the reason for that is around currency depreciation and kind of weak economy. They couldn't reprice for that currency depreciation, um, so that contributed to the group's margins declining. And and maybe the last thing more recently I'd say is inflation. Um, so barley, which is a key ingredient for beer, was at one stage was up 70% year to date, right? So th- you ca- you just can't reprice for that. Um, so why am I optimistic on the company? I think the first reason actually is that they m- materially cut down the debt. So they're now down to 70, 70 B um, in, in dollars and, you know, nearly three times EBITDA. So that's more normal levels and actually you know, when one looks into the next um, one to two years, you'll see them being able to be in a position to start ramping up shareholder payouts, um, you know, given that their debt is more manageable. I think whilst the market's been stressing about um, Brazil, they've been quietly making way in headway in Mexico and Colombia. Um, so those two businesses are now as big as the U.S. businesses in terms of their contribution to profits, you know, so they've been able to to grow well there. And then lastly, they've stabilized Brazil. So they're gaining market share. And it's really been through the introduction of new products, so zero beers, hard salsas. Um, So what they actually say they learned from SAB, they didn't do very well. They said they didn't have a low value segment. You know, so if you were to think about black label um, carling, which they've now been better at introducing in some of their markets, and that's helped them restore their market share. Um, and lastly, the U.S.'s decline is is also slowing, um, you know, so so that that's less of a problem going forward. Um, so they their volumes in um, 2021 um, were 9% of, ahead of pre-COVID, you know, so showing that the business is, is still growing. Um, so, I, I mean, I do think, that, and actually they've been able to do that in, at a time when they've raised prices per litre by some 8%, so really just showing that in this time of high inflation, Beer companies are pricing power, you know, and I think that's going to be important um, going forward. Um, I mean, naturally, the one thing I haven't spoken about is obviously that cost inflation is, is not good for them, right? But it's not good for anyone. Now, their profits are nearly double what the peer group earns. So, as an example, um, Heineken, which is the, maybe the next closest peers, earns margins of 14, they're closer to 25. You know, so this will actually allow them to absorb a little bit more of the price impact and then gain share um, from that. So it should actually you know, probably will come out of this quite okay. Um, so yeah, so I think, so the key thing going forward is that obviously debt is down and we think profits will will start to improve as they reprice, you know, for the, for the current inflation and then margins will you know, will ultimately open up. Um, I mean, the company is trading probably as cheap as it's, it's traded, you know, during the GFC as well as the taper tantrums, et cetera. So, 
we think the valuation is also quite attractive. Um, yeah, I mean, my next so my next company is uh, Toho. Actually, it also came out of the SAD stable. Um, so they're the largest gaming company in South Africa. So I mean, they own all the premier assets. So if you were to in Monte Casino, Sun Coast, you know, so the the kind of um, Galaxy Bingo, um, as well as they have half the market share in, in LPMs or limited payout machines. Um, I mean, the surprising thing with gaming, I guess you might say, aren't we entering a recession, you know, whatever. And then, so the ship actually bottomed at one rand 70 during COVID, and then it's now trading at 12 rand. So it's quite, you know, might say, well, why am I recommending it a buy now again? Um, you know, is really that, um, you know, for, for Zorko, they did peak at 12 billion um, during COVID. It's now down to nine. The market cap is 12. You know, we think as, again, it's not dissimilar to Anhauser, as time progresses, um, you know, you'll see more of the cash flows actually flowing to shareholders rather rather than de debt holders, as has been the case for the last couple of years. We are of the view, actually, that um, what so a few years ago, it's all what emerged. Um, what's now was a new listing on the JSC Southern Sun um, Limited. Now we are of the view what they were doing is that they were taking highly profitable gaming cash flows and they were plowing them into the hotel businesses, which is actually not a great business. You know, so they were destroying returns. So we think actually subsequent to the demerger, shareholders are well positioned to to start enjoying those cash flows um, themselves. Um, you, yeah, so that's you know that's quite key to our investment case. And again, it's another company that we think is probably trading on six times normal earnings. Um, so you know, happy to to continue to own it. Um, and then yeah, my my last pick um, so was WBHO, so so the second largest of the South African um, construction companies after Robex. Uh, what's interesting actually is that Marion Roberts is now a two billion rand business, which is um, quite um, quite scary. Uh, but really, I mean, my you know our thesis on um, the construction counters is, um, and you would have seen the report issued by the South African Institute of Civil Engineers earlier in the week that basically everything is crumbling with the exception of national roads and airports. You know, so I do think our government has actually painted themselves into a corner as well as our, our municipalities. They will have no option but to start spending. Um, and we think that, you know, a counter like WBHO um, is, is well positioned. In the past, construction companies weren't very good at converting projects into profits. Right, but actually, we think WBHO has been one of the better ones, and hence we, you know, we're happy to buy that and kind of keep the option that things will you'll start seeing more more volume um, on on the construction projects side. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's that. Thanks, 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 Lenovo. Um, I've got a couple of questions, and uh, we we are running out of time, so I'll 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 shoot these quickly. Um, I would love, uh, Tami, for you to come in on um, Wilberforce Changes question, which says, any concerns around further dilution in Orion minerals? And then Lonobo, um, Chris Marketbull <laughs> says, um, the recent rally in the US where the market is trying to front run the, the Fed pivot, do you think this is still a bear market rally? Or um, do you think that uh, that that maybe we we we're starting to see um, kind of the, the 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 beginning of the end? Uh, Tammy, over to you. Um, no, not worried. Uh, we would we will follow our rights. We are shareholders. will follow our rights. I think it's the nature of of exploration businesses that they they need a lot of funding and they try and stay out of the dead pool. Um, the di the dilution will be inevitable. It may not happen today, but eventually over time, they'll have to raise more capital um, to continue to build out the mining project operation and try and give shareholders a decent return out without loading debt onto the business. So our view is we're not worried. Uh, we, we understand the sector uh, really well. Uh, and we've, we've, we've done some work in understanding what it will take to get uh, this project up and running. Um, I think uh, as, as with all shares, um, and all businesses, when new information comes up, you reserve the right to make a, a revised decision. But as yeah. it stands today, um, we will follow our rights. We'll, we are not necessarily afraid of, of dilution. Uh, we prefer a, a broad-based equity uh, ownership rather than a very debt-laden exploration opportunity. 
Good. Uh, Lenovo, do you think the market's ahead of itself in terms of the, the numbers that we saw out of the U.S. from an inflation perspective? Or, or do you think that, um, you know, the Fed was 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 cautioning that uh, maybe it's not the beginning of the end, but but the market seems to be thinking so in the U.S.? Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, Sam, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. And it's, you know, the one, if I'd, you know, the million dollar question to answer. I mean, I, you know, on on the one hand, I'd say that the market has definitely become much more macro driven in the in recent years than used to be the case. And given that, you know, if I consider that most likely these rate hikes will, will have an impact on the economy and you'll actually start seeing numbers slowing, you know, so consumer spending less uh, businesses uh, as well. And then also just maybe add to that is the fact that there's a lot of debt in the system. You know, if you think about all the quantitative easing that was done, right? So I have a hard time believing that this macro driven market will now completely ignore negative data that comes out, you know, and then so that's on kind of on maybe on where I think the sentiment is going, you know, and so we've looked at historically, when is the market typically bottomed during recessions? And we are still trading at higher levels relative to where the markets typically bottom during recessions. You know, so, I mean, obviously the central assumption is that, that we're going into a recession, yeah. which is not, yeah, you know. So I, I probably think there is risk that actually, um, you know, there's more corrections coming. And I, I think as a strategy, buy, buy the dip hasn't worked, right? So you would have bought the dip and it just kept dipping lower. You get a slight rally and just keeps going lower and lower and lower, you know, so yeah. I'm not sure that that trend has been broken yet. All right, good. Um, we have uh, a minute and a half left. So, Anthony, I'm going to ask you to please address um, Aubrey Kravitz's question around uh, Grinrod shipping and its potential relationship with Grinrod. So that was a that was an unbundling a few years ago, right? Um, is there anything happening there that we should be uh, aware of in, in, in half a minute? No, I'll, I'll make it very quick, simple. There are two separate companies, and Grindrod Shipping is being taken over by an international company. So Grin, the Grindrod listed on the JSC will just be a pure uh, logistics, ports, and rail company. Grindrod Shipping is, is vanishing into the EFA, and uh, we should focus our efforts just on the JSC entity, which I think, as I mentioned in my segment, has significant potential going forward. And I think the very fact that the outgoing CEO, Andrew Waller, uh, bought 400,000 shares in the last uh, few days uh, at 10 Rand, when the stock was trading at 8 Rand only a few weeks ago, why would the outgoing CEO be buying 400,000 shares for just over 4 million Rand, uh, given that he's handing over to the new CEO, perhaps for something on the go, or perhaps he's just uh, very excited about future prospects. So as far as I'm concerned, Grindrod uh, Holdings uh, is the place to be. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, we had a good question uh, from uh, Lamu Tlamini, but uh, Lamu, apologies, we, we, we're running out of time. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, being on the show with us. It's been a fantastic time and I um, hope to see you again soon. And thank you to the audience for uh, tuning in. And it's certainly been an insightful uh, conversation. And again, uh, just a disclaimer, that uh, the views on the show aren't uh, necessarily the views of the JSE. Thank you very much, everyone.